Hello, everyone. Just for my uh, information, how many of you are already writing uh, ML models in one of the frameworks, you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, Hugging Face? What? All right, it's so almost a, a good, good fraction of the people. So my goal today is to um, encourage you through examples and descriptions of uh, the technology behind the results that I'm going to present um, to have you very um, eager to try out the uh, Bow Pod 64 that will be installed to replace the Mark I uh, Pod 64 that you have in your AI testbed. So let's begin. So the topics that I intend to uh, cover today are a little bit about the company Graphcore, um, what, when we were founded and that kind of stuff, our processor architecture, our system architecture, and our software and enablement. Then I'll cover briefly some general benchmarks, some customer use cases or um, case studies, and then two Argon applications, uh, Candle Uno and Bragg NN. And then finally, a teaser of uh, a computer that will be the next step in our roadmap, named after Jack Good, who was a cryptologist uh, that worked with Alan Turing in Bletchley Park. And the, uh, the reasons behind that will become evident. Um, Graphcore, uh, the company, founded in 2016, the technology is the IPU, or the Intelligence Processor Unit. We have about 650 people globally, geographically distributed. We've raised over $730 million from um, a range of uh, premier venture capital firms. And since it was formed in Bristol, England, um, they like to name uh, software components and uh, machines after districts in London. So Poplar and Bow are two districts in London. So if you're wondering where that came from. So what does Graphcore do? Well, we design and, and manufacture the IPU, um, the chip. We produce the enablement and software in order to actually run the chip. And then we build systems with the chip. So what about the processor architecture? Why should you care? Uh, what's interesting about it? Well, it's actually the first processor to use a wafer on wafer process, whereby um, the reticle limited sized uh, chip, logic chip, and a second chip with uh, um, deep trench capacitors to act as a very high um, response um, current source um, allows us to run this version of our chip 40% faster than the previous version. So that bumps us up to 350 teraflops aggregate for the chip. Um, it reduces our, or optimizes our power delivery. It's got the same 900 megabytes of on-chip memory as the previous version. 1,472 independent processors and almost 9,000 threads. It also has 10 serial links to give it an aggregate um, interconnect bandwidth of 320 gigabytes per second. So this is a diagram of the wafer on wafer stacking. And the top uh, rectangle is the top wafer layer and that is houses the deep trench capacitors. And then the bottom layer is the logic, uh, logic layer. And the salmon colored rectangles are the, or the combination of a salmon colored rectangle and the darker, I guess, salmon colored rectangle is called a tile. And it's a combination of a processor and a local memory. There are 1,472 of those tiles, so 1,472 units with a processor and local memory. F using those 1,472 tiles, we can run those 9,000 threads because the processor core in each of the tiles um, is what's called a barrel pipeline processor. And where it has hard six hardware um, supported threads, 
And from the point of view of each of those six threads, because it's barrel pipelined, those threads execute in a round robin fashion. But those threads, from their point of view of the pipeline, every memory access and every arithmetic operation completes in a single cycle. So it makes it very simple um, to predict um, the timings of operations through the pipeline. So those um, six threads can communicate through their local memory. That core is, not, is a um, single issue and it is in order, so it's a simple pipeline, but it does have enough instruction set coverage to execute its own programs on its own. But they are programs that are specific to processing tensors and other ML-related operations, such as accelerating uh, rectification functions for activation functions, uh, TANH, um, and also we do stochastic rounding in hardware um, for this. We also do random number generation uh, in hardware in a single instruction. So the other piece that should be noted is the central spine that you see running between the columns of the uh, tiles um, from your left to your right. Um, that is the exchange. And that is a global all-to-all -all interconnect, non-blocking, 11 terabytes per second. So you, we can run all reduces, scatters, and other operations like that at uh, 11 terabytes a second. The aggregate uh, bandwidth of the local memories, I wanted to go, I didn't mention this, is 65.4 terabytes a second. So the programming model that we implemented at GraphCore for uh, the IPU draws upon something called bulk synchronous parallel. And bulk synchronous parallel was a bridging model for parallel computation. And by bridging model, it, what I'm talking about is an abstraction of the physical realization of the parallel hardware system as a target for software and as a target for performance analysis of parallel algorithms. And this was invented or uh, proposed by Leslie Valiant um, in the 1980s and it was most notably uh, received, I suppose, in a paper in 1990. In this um, bridging model, the computation proceeds by repeating what's called a supercycle. And that supercycle consists of three phases. Um, it has a compute phase, it has a sync phase, and an exchange phase. So you're doing local computation, global barrier synchronization, and global communication. So in GraphCore, we, instead of having some distinct hard, parallel hardware architecture that um, you have an intermediate software layer that provides this abstraction to the software and for analysis of performance, um, we actually implemented BSP or bulk synchronous parallel in hardware. And so the people always talk about compute sync and exchange, but in reality, you have to do first the sync, then the exchange, and then the compute. So if you look at the, the little cartoon at the bottom, the yellow here is all the barrier synchronization. Then after the synchronization is complete, the global tile-to-tile -tile exchange occurs. And there may be a varying amount of communication necessary to each tile. But after that, on a, each given tile, whenever that communication completes, you're able to immediately begin computation on that tile until you've completed the computation using local memory, local operands, um, and then you assert your sync request and you wait for the, for the global barrier synchronization. So if you have um, a deficient compiler, 
or you have insufficient um, parallelism in the application, you may end up with prohibitively long or a, a prohibitively high uh, percentage of waiting for synchronization. In applications that we've seen and through the work on our software stack, this does not present a problem for real world um, applications. In fact, if the, we see anything that is uh, non-trivial in that waiting time, that's seen as something that we have to look at to optimize and fix. Another thing I wanted to mention about BSP is because of these barrier synchronizations, it's impossible to have a circular dependency. So if you program to this paradigm, you don't have to worry about deadlock and you don't have to worry about live locks. So that was very attractive from the point of view of enabling the software to drive this hardware in a highly efficient manner. So let's talk about the, the system architecture. We've got this chip, it's got this whiz-bang BSP execution model, it's got this uh, fancy barrel, um, barrel pipeline processor. What do we do with it? So the, the smallest saleable SKU uh, from GraphCore right now is what we call a Bow 2000 IPU machine. Basically, it's a one-use sled that has we have four IPUs, and all this is the cooling. We have a gateway under this heat sink. We have DDR DIMMs, and we have a network interface card for communication with a, a, ser a host server. So with the four IPUs, basically this blade has 1.4 petaflops of AI compute. Now, I, it, you, one of the things you'll notice with all the ML vendors, they talk about flops when they're talking about FP16. And that's annoying if uh, you've been around computing for a while, which I imagine all of you have. Um, but it is uh, FP16 uh, co operations. And in that also, a quick, with the four IPUs, that blade has 3.6 gigabytes of in-processor memory at a total for the blade of 260 terabytes a second. So let's look at the, the logical arrangement or the logical connectivity of those four IPUs on the blade. In the vertical direction, there's a single serial link, IPU link, at 64 gigabytes a second. Horizontally, there are three of those links for 192 gigabytes a second of communication. Then in the center is that gateway that I talked about. The gateway interfaces to the DRAM and interfaces to the NIC, which then connects to the, the host server. And then horizontally here in blue is what we call the gateway link, and that's 100 gigabit ethernet. And the next slide, it'll become apparent what these are used for. So, I did want to point out that we also have almost up to half a, gig, uh, a terabyte of um, DDR RAM hanging off that gateway. So for large models, you can spool uh, activations off into that DDR, or for instance, like the, ad, the moments for an atom optimizer, you can spool those off into DDR and stream them back in as needed. So this is a diagram of connectivity um, to perform our scale out. In the vertical, you have the logical diagram of the blade and they are connected into a vertically into a pair of toruses. Um, and then the gray lines are the 100 gig ethernet coming from the NIC cards back to 
the server host. Horizontally, the, uh, I guess, uh, aqua colored lines are the gateway links or the 100 gig gigabit ethernet uh, from rack to rack. So roughly, each vertical stack here corresponds to a rack. And what that would look like is um, here in this uh, diagram where you have um, the most uh, applicable, smallest configuration is a single host server and it's directly connected via ethernet to four blades. The more, uh, and then if you added a top of rack switch, you can end up with adding um, 16 of the blades to have a pod 64. And you can have up to four hosts, or we support at the time, uh, up to four hosts connected through that switch to all the blades. And the pod 64 is the main unit of scale out. So going to larger installations, you can scale it out to here. So this is just a, a picture of our racks. And one thing I wanted to note on this slide is, you know, for a pod 64, you're getting 22.4 petaflops of FP16 performance. So that's what uh, you're going to have in your uh, AI test bed. So what about software enablement? Um, you can lay out an array of ALUs and have a very high peak capability, but unless you have the structures around it to supply operands and consume results and the software to coordinate that activity, um, you aren't going to be able to utilize those, those uh, ALUs and get real-world application performance. So we have a, a quite mature uh, stack Primarily, we work with customers who work in the predominant uh, machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Hugging Face, those types of frameworks. We do have a layer that accepts C++ code, um, but it's a different programming mindset than you'd have in writing kernels in CUDA. And we also have um, debug tools, including a cycle by cycle profiler that gives you a graphical uh, timeline. You can punch in and get all kinds of information about what kind of operator consumed how much memory and how much um, time. Another thing that's very important is for doing data and model parallelism, um, that is already supported in our, in our stack. You don't have to go get a different library in order to do that. In other words, um, if you want to shard tensors between uh, IPUs, that is supported. If you want to pipeline a model, that is supported. Now, it's not totally automated. You have to specify which layers go into what pipeline stage, but that is supported. Um, over here is um, some views of the displays of our uh, profiler and debugger uh, tools. So in terms of how hard is it to port um, a design or a model in an ML framework uh, over to run on an IPU? And this is just a simple model. It's a convolution model in Keras. On the left-hand side is the GPU, and on the right-hand side um, is what you need to do for the IPU. And basically, you're just importing the uh, software uh, you've got to get a, a config, which holds information about what kind of IPUs you're going to use. You select the number of IPUs, you configure it, and then with this uh, strategy object, which holds things like your pipelining specification or whether you want to shard the tensors or you just want to do um, model replication for data parallelism, that, that is supported. So we also have a, a pretty extensive model garden in a range of frameworks covering a spectrum or a wide spectrum of different application areas and different model types. And that's up on our website. So general benchmarks. 
I have these in here, and I'm going to go through them pretty quickly because I just want to give you the impression that th by across a wide variety of models, we can produce very good performance. In some cases, um, a really surprising performance compared to GPUs. And also, we have all of our uh, performance results, including the exact configurations and the exact scripts that were used to reproduce the results that we claim up on our website at this link. This slide, what I want to show is across designs like ResNet and BERT, you'll see, you know, the stair step of our scaling as we go from a pod 16 to a pod 256 and also the baseline performance. Now, one thing to point out, this DGX A100 is about twice the cost of this pod 16. We participate in MLPerf, um, so we produce uh, submissions uh, almost every time. Um, so you can see how we perform versus others, uh, given a, a set of uh, tight rules on how the benchmarks are conducted. So here's some training benchmarks. Um, don't want to spend a whole lot of time on those. Inference benchmarks, also the bars are bigger for graph core. So some customer case studies. This is with Slack and um, the Leland Stanford Junior University. It's using a convolutional model um, in, uh, to compress data. No, actually it's, what is it? To denoise detector images. And, um, you know, we're getting 7.7x for inference and 2.4 times uh, the improvement in uh, time to train versus uh, the GPU. Here's one for graph neural networks. Uh, because of the flexibility of our architecture, um, where we can handle, you know, in our local memories, we can handle uh, non-uniform memory accesses, we can handle um, what you would call the divergent warp situation if you're programming for the GPU quite easily and quite efficiently. Um, graph neural networks is like an ideal application to demonstrate our greater flexibility and performance. And in this case, this was 10x faster than A100. Here's one with the uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, the headline shows 36, fast, 36 times faster on Schnet for a 500K water molecule um, determination of its potential energy. And uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer because it, it's eight IPUs versus four V100s. So if you scale that, it's still 18x, okay? But the reason why it was done this way is that you can fit the model and all of the activations and uh, all the necessary data uh, on the eight IPUs in their on-chip memory. So that's one reason that was done. But if you calculate it all out, um, it's, uh, what is it? Uh, if we looked at scaling it to a bow, which is our new, the shipping version, which is 40% faster than the version used here, and scaled this V100 to an A100, you're still looking at like a 12.6x advantage. So this is uh, what I was talking about in terms of bow. Those uh, case studies where they were in the past before Bo was released, um, they could be improved potentially by up to 40%. And this is just a diagram or a, a chart showing a wide variety of benchmarks and uh, you know, scaling almost at uh, the clock rate scaling. One of the uh, applications that had been mentioned earlier was using a neural network surrogate for a complex simulation. And this is a case study with the uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, where they were getting five times the performance of an A100 um, using uh, IPUs. 
So in argon type applications, in the uh, cancer um, research, uh, Candle Uno, um, we were, the idea or the goal was to train the model to predict uh, a drug response to cancer cells. And the goal was to reduce the time to train and scale. And so we were able to show 6x the performance at higher precision. And then here's the, the Bragg in in model um, that was used to find the Bragg peaks in a collider detector image. And it was trying to do it sub-pixel accuracy. And in this particular case, we found that the flexibility of our system allowed us to take uh, operations that were formally done on the host and move them onto the IPU. And so in a progression of different steps in doing that, we were able uh, to deliver um, versus A100 5x times the speed and versus the V100 11 times the speed. Now right out of the box, just porting it, it was three to four times faster. But in the demo um, that I'll be doing if there's uh, you know, interest, um, I'll be talking about and showing uh, this design running. And then finally, the Good computer, named after Jack Good. And this is to indicate uh, what we're intending to do at GraphCore as our next step in our roadmap. And basically, we're looking at 10 exaflops. We're going to use that wafer on wafer technology, not just for deep trench capacitors, but also for logic uh, wafers. And the idea is to be able to handle models with 500 trillion parameters. And the reason for that scale is that, you know, the human brain probably has 100 trillion synapses. And if you roughly equate a synapse with a weight or a parameter of a neural network model, you'd need 100 trillion parameters to try to approach the computing capacity of the human brain. So that's what this is meant to do. So thank you.